Hello, Eorzeans! I'm Lukeel Bravestone and welcome to another episode of Remnants of a Realm. Last week we revisited Falcon's Nest, Owl's Nest, Camp Riversmeet and Aetherites. Just also want to remind everyone that we have a Discord channel that you can join if you want to hang out with all the cool people. <laughs> Link is in the description. Come say hi! And finally, all episodes of Remnants of a Realm will now be transcribed and put up in text form with pictures and more information on our website speakersxiv.com. Link to that is in the description. Let's get on with the episode then, shall we? On Patreon we released this photo for our junior editor and superior speakers asking where we're going. Well, here's the answer. We're turning our eyes towards Lenosha and Wineport. Wineport was a hamlet located in the far west of eastern Lenosha. Remember when we talked about Aleport in episode 6? Well, where Aleport makes ale, Wineport makes wine. Wineport was supposedly a vineyard, but as you can see there were very few grapes growing in this area in 1.0. Uh, because of its position and proximity to Ugamaro, it was, as you can probably gather, most likely a planned hamlet defense location that sadly never saw any use. Wineport was the smallest of all the Eorzean hamlets, only consisting of two small buildings and two shacks, with a third and fourth building in the background out of reach. Wineport was the prime location for the Maelstrom Grand Company quest, The Price of Integrity, where much of the questline plays out. Other than that though, Wineport was more or less a deserted settlement that players mostly visited out of curiosity, but would quickly realize that there wasn't much to do here. Today. Wineport has grown to become a more visually pleasing place. Still located to the west of eastern Lenosha, an area that got hit pretty hard by Dalamid fragments, and the entrance location for the Binding Coil of Bahamut. The vineyards are finally visible and buildings have popped up around the settlement. Lore-wise, Wineport is on the mend after the calamity after losing a lot of the existing vineyards. Ah, uh, I see. Now also sporting its own etherite, menders and vendors, Wineport is a fully functional settlement you are sure to visit a lot in your adventures across Eorzea. Now let's take a quick walk to the very south of eastern Lenosha and Red Rooster Stead. Red Rooster Stead was a small settlement located along the Lathagran East Road, right next to the loading tunnel between eastern and lower Lenosha. The Red Rooster Stead served players with a much needed mender and vendor as well as an achievement NPC. Oh, I hear you mutter to yourself, achievement NPC? Well, let me quickly explain to you how achievements worked in Final Fantasy XIV 1.0. To earn achievements, you had to unlock achievements by speaking to the corresponding achievement NPC. All achievement NPCs had a unique icon on the world map. The different categories and NPCs were Battle, Adelon, Character, Rambros, Synthesis, Dediadi, Gathering, Rebecca, Materia, Almanane, Quest, Derwin, Items, Terimo, Seasonal Events, Jonathus, Dungeons, Milith Ironheart, and Exploration, Nedric Ironheart. Once unlocked, you could start working towards the achievement. Once an achievement was unlocked that would reward you with a title or an item, you had to talk to the correct achievement NPC twice. Once to actually unlock the achievement, and the second time to receive the item or title. Today, only Jonathus remains as the sole achievement NPC. All achievements are available to you from the moment you start playing, but you still have to locate Jonathus and speak to him to actually get your rewards. Titles are obtained automatically. Thank the 12. Anyways, back to Red Rooster Stead. Notice something peculiar here? Do you see what they had but Wineport did not? That's right. Grapes. Take that, wine port. In addition to grapes, it had lots of vegetable fields and fruit orchards, as well as providing Limsa Lominsa with textiles. In fact, most of Red Rooster Stead's produce went directly to Limsa Lominsa. It also had these lovely textured rocks that you could sit on around this neat little campfire. Mm. <gasps> Today, there isn't much that remain of the original Red Rooster Stead. As with most 1.0 structures, the new Red Rooster Stead looks way more impressive. Large brick buildings, spires, gates and windmills all make this place look absolutely beautiful. It also serves as the main scenario location as well as being located right next to the Mist Housing District entrance. Red Rooster Stead's fields have grown massive, now having large sheep flocks, wheat fields, pumpkin fields, peppers, 
green thing salad cabbage herbs grapes and oranges hey i'm orange no not you being one of those areas you would expect an etherite crystal based on its location it is surprising to find that it doesn't have one it has everything else though a leave meat delivery mogul a chocobo keep mender and vendor Okay, let's travel back in time again and look at another open world dungeon that didn't make it into 2.0. Sp 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 this was an open world dungeon located in Lower Lenosha, with Morabi Bay as the closest teleport point. Limsa Lominsa was located to the northwest of the dungeon. Before we actually get to the inside of the dungeon, let me just vent out the frustration around how incredibly annoying it was to access this dungeon. If you didn't use the Camp Bearded Rock Teleport to Morby Bay, see this road here. This is the Lathagran East Road. Oh, you say to yourself, I just walk off that road directly into the dungeon. How neat. No, that's not how it worked. <laughs> no, 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 no. You see, there are different shades of green here. Light green and dark green. Dark green being below the light green. So even as you desperately try to get down to the entrance, it is all to no avail. Instead, you have to walk past the invisible barriers here, walk along this path, across the bridge, and down here, where the light and dark green sort of fade into each other, and walk towards the dungeon from there. Gods, it was so frustrating, it makes my blood boil just thinking about it. Gods! Okay, let's go inside. Shpoche Sh Sh did not have leave meets, and was more or less a free dungeon in the sense that you could just walk in without any prerequisites. Shpoche was a cave complex serving as one of the destination of Lim Lane's followers in their yearly pilgrimage, having a total of five locations from Lim Lane's ascent, the tale of the goddess's life. These locations were Lim Lane's Resolve, Bearing, Encounter, Trial, Stand, and Resolve. Once inside Spoche, your goal was to find keys to various treasure coffers spread around the dungeon. These coffers dropped the plundered gear set, in addition to other items such as potions. The coffer keys were obtained by mostly defeating mobs or in other chests in the dungeon. But Spoche also contained notorious monsters, three in fact, Giant Remora, Shearing Sheridan and Lone Coerl. When defeating these, they would drop the better gear in the dungeon. In the case of Shearing Sheridan, it was located on map 2, it had no special pop condition, and would drop the plunder Cavalier sat. Giant Remora would spawn in the only circular room of map 3 with no pop condition. He would drop a pirate's bandana. Lone Coerl was a conditional pop located in this big circular room at the western edge of the last map. He spawned the exact moment all jackal pups on this floor was dead and would drop the Coerl's eye. As the calamity raged on, the entrance to Spoche collapsed and the dungeon is entirely inaccessible today. However, if you look closely at the map design for Spoche, you might find that it looks mysteriously similar to that of Sestasha. It is very possible that this dungeon was used as the primary inspiration for Sestasha, so if you miss Spoche, don't worry, it lives on in Sestasha. Now for the last part. Path Companion. Upon reaching the unified main story in 1.0, you would finally meet Minfilia and the Path of the Twelve. Once you agreed to become a walker and your name was entered into the register, you were asked to choose your Path Companion. You could choose the class you wanted that companion to be, and you'd be presented with four different characters you could choose from as your companion. The race and gender of the companion would dictate his or her personality. Let's go through what these were. Here are male, a fine, if somewhat conventional, companion, possessing a strong sense of justice, an indefatigable spirit, and so on. Here a female, a gregarious, though slightly egocentric young woman, if you can put up with her, she won't let you down. Ellison Male. Being a man wholly focused on his mission, this highborn fellow can seem rather curt, if not downright rude. Ellison Female. A studious sort with exemplary manners. Serious and trustworthy as you'd expect, but possibly a little stiff for some tastes. Still, if you loathe over familiarity, she might just be the companion, sorry, colleague for you. Lalafell Male. It is said that a hero lies within us all. In the case of this rather sheltered young Lalafell, one might assume that the hero in question does so under his bed, hoping his harpy of a mother won't think to look for him there. Will you be the one to coax him out? 
Lalafell female. Does your world want for a wealth of wordplay and wit? An abundance of alliteration, assonance aplenty, and a soupzon of siblings to seal the deal? Well, you were warned. Mikote female. A lady who knows what she likes and likes a little bit of everything. Don't be fooled by her coquettish manner, all too apparent charms. In her breast beats the fiery heart of a warrior. Not to worry though, she'll be gentle. Assuming that's what you'd like. Rogadin male. When the going gets tough, it's often nice to have a big, earnest, slightly credulous friend around. And they don't come much bigger than this straight-talking Rogadin. Okay, that's all well and good, but what was the purpose of this companion? Well, it's a bit weird. Your path companion would appear in cutscenes, adding some flavor text into the mix. The path companion basically aided you in quests and in some instances would fight with you. As the 6th Astral Era came to a close, you and your path companion went separate ways and you never heard from him or her again. The path companion did most likely not survive the calamity. Or did they? And with that, we've reached the end of this 10th episode of Remnants of Aurel. I hope you enjoyed your time here, leave a like if you did and subscribe if you haven't already. And let me know in the comments what you think of the topics of this video. Do you want the path companion system back? What do you think happened to them? Were you aware of Shpoche and what do you think of the free dungeon system? Do we need it in the current incarnation of the game? And what about Aleport and Red Rooster Stead? Do you remember their original 1.0 appearance? A special shout out to all our Patreon supporters, you warm a fellow Aorcian's heart. I'll be back next week with another episode of Remnants of a Realm. See you then Aorcians. Until then, may you ever walk in the light of the crystal.